uh, at this point in my lifetime is completely meaningless. It's now par for the course. Everyone's secular. It doesn't make me interesting or, or unusual. But I've moved on and I have found a new creed to reject. <laughs> and that's uh, the left wing progressive orthodoxy uh, that we're now calling woke. And I think that may be one reason I respond so strongly to this movement is that I have a history of finding orthodoxy oppressive and of of intrinsically rejecting uh, what what is imposed on me as a set creed. And this has become a set creed. And that makes me immediately suspicious of it and resentful of it. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, you've rejected religious faith, you write, but on the other hand, you also you also write that to a surprising extent, Christian values are my values. Mm -hmm. And in its own conniving, underhanded way, my secular writing also elevates love, decency, charity, loyalty, responsibility, sacrifice, clemency, and the Protestant work ethic. So are you sort of as Oriana, Oriana Falacci, a Christian atheist, is that? the right label for you? Hello? I don't reject that. <laughs> it's kind of clever. Um, I think that I've come full circle in a lot of ways. And uh, having come to recognize that despite a, a natural heretical impulse, that I am fully socialized in the Judeo Christian ethic. And, and in the same way, I have come to become more of a traditionalist. Uh, you know, I grew up at the tail end of the 1960s. And at that time, of course, I was reading Kurt Vonnegut and, you know, most, mostly modern and rebellious writers. Uh, but I, I now have a greater appreciation for the foundation of those later works. I, I treasure Western civilization more consciously than I once did. Uh, I feel more of more indebted to it than I once did. And, and in that sense, much more artistically humble. Um, and, and I think part of this, of course, is, is that you, you feel the, urge to come to the aid of anything that seems imperiled. So mm -hmm. uh, back in the days that Western civilization didn't seem to need any help, then I didn't feel the need to go go on some kind of crusade. I mean, mm -hmm. and of course, my ambition would be to contribute to Western civilization in my tiny way. But uh even in terms of those values that you listed out, I feel that those values are in many ways being imperiled and it makes me more conscious of them and uh, more, I mean, you, you know, one of the things that, that the progressive movement is violating is a sense of decency, right? And, and also clemency, a, a, an absolute refusal to forgive, which, uh, violates my own father's uh, primary uh, preoccupation in in his work. He His work was all about forgiveness. He wrote whole books about it. And so in an, in an odd way, again, I come full circle that that I acknowledge my debt to my father and to all those Christian values that that he represented that that have, secular counterparts and, and so that even if you don't believe that Jesus Christ was the son of God and all that came with that of uh, the the underpinnings uh mm -hmm. are still in me and and I think I'm now finally old enough to acknowledge that and to accept it as a gift uh, rather than an imposition mm -hmm. okay so you know, this is a speculation, but many uh, university professors, and here I include myself, seem very nostalgic of the times when reason was respected, was sort of the currency in universities. 
But on the other hand, many of these professors hold a very narrow definition of reason, in my opinion, where words such as meaning or purpose are sort of empty, right, from a rational perspective. Do, do, don't you think that some of the nihilism that we observe in universities among students and also among some faculty can, can be a reaction to the sort of narrow-minded positivism that uh, at least used to dominate our universities, if that makes any sense. Well, I think we can give students who buy into the whole left-wing agenda at least sometimes credit for good intentions. Um, they want a sense of purpose and mm -hmm. obviously are failing to find it in certain more traditional ways of thinking and mm -hmm. i'm not quite sure what the answer to that is i mm -hmm. i i i think one of the things that keeps me engaged with what i have to perceive as a battle is that i don't know what the answer is and i don't know how to get out of this and i don't blame students for wanting to to feel part of something larger. Uh, I don't like a lot of what they're, they have chosen to be become part of, but I, I'm sympathetic with the impulse and the, you know, the, to, to a degree that there, there's an impulse to community, which is good. And then there's also an impulse to conformity, which is often bad. Mm -hmm. You wrote about losing your brother to morbid obesity. And I thought the story of a big brother was, was very sad, but also very beautiful. Uh, and on the other hand, you were very critique, you're harshly critiqued for writing about it. Can you tell us a bit about your brother's story and about the controversy that ensued the publication of Big Brother? Well, my, my brother used to be a normal weight most of his life, and he had a series of calamities, um, both emotional and physical, that meant he couldn't move much. And uh, some of his previous routes to indulgence were closed off to him. He was always addicted to something. So he turned to food um, and became enormously fat. Uh, mm. And that was a very painful process to watch and a complicated one. It wasn't as simple as, oh, he's He's greedy. It was mm. deeper and more disturbing than that, really. Mm. And uh, when he died, shortly thereafter, I I wrote a book that addressed the issue of fat and ultimately used a knockoff version of my brother, which may not have done him justice. <laughs> um in order to take on the subject of of obesity and overeating and and in in some ways the larger subject of of appetite and uh, inability to become satiated in our culture, the looking a little harder at the whole subject of what is the hunger for? <laughs> since very early on when you're eating, you're not really physically hungry anymore. So what what is it? And you know, this was a this was a novel that was written from a perspective of an enormous empathy, and because I I had seen my brother treated callously, and um, he he was it was so odd to have someone so large and yet so unseen by strangers. And you know he was a he he tested as a genius level IQ. I mean, this guy was not just fat. But what was interesting about the post publication process was that not only were most of the people who came to my publicity events thin, which I thought was interesting because you'd think that the issue of overweight would be interesting to people who were overweight, but it turns out that it was mostly thin people who wanted to feel superior. <laughs> um, but I, I did not um, please the uh, 
uh, healthy at any size movement. They did not want my sympathy. And after having some lengthy correspondences with some of these people, I realized that I was never going to please them because I was not qualified to address this material as far as they were concerned. And that was because I was not fat. And only someone who was obese uh, could possibly uh, defend and and explain what it's like to to be very heavy in this culture. And this is this is a this whole credentialism, if you will, about who has the the standing to to make to make certain points, to address certain subjects. This has got worse and worse. Uh, it's uh, it's accelerated since Big Brother was published. And it's also effectively part of the, the cultural appropriation issue that um, you have to be from a particular group to write about it. And, and of course, groups can be segmented in, in, into infinitely smaller groups. So the uh, the calculus of this mm-hmm. that you is that you approach you rapidly approach a limit where you can only write about yourself and your own life and your personal experience and 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 that's your business and you can speak for yourself and it it, it essentially it's it, it eliminates sociology i mean you can't you can't you can't make generalizations about other people. You can't make observations about other people. And it certainly eliminates fiction writing. Mm-hmm. So I'll ask you about uh, the cultural appropriation affair later. But I also wanted to move on a little bit to your career. Uh, you, you've been very successful as both as a journalist and as a writer. But you also write that you were not successful at, at all at the beginning of your career. You, you say, I spent 12 years in the literally literary wilderness as a nobody with a horrible high likelihood of getting nobody. And I wonder if you can tell us a little bit about the beginnings of your career when you were poor. Uh, your books were initially rejected by many publishers and, and how different was your life back then? Well, I guess on a day-to-day basis, it was very different in that I didn't get invited to talk to anyone at Stanford University. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I there there were advantages to that. I had fewer interruptions, and it was easier to concentrate on a given manuscript. But it was no pleasure to write that manuscript and constantly be anxious that it would never see the light of day. Mm-hmm. I have a tendency to sentimentalize the first uh, half of my career uh, in, in a way that is uh, putting on rose-colored glasses, looking at my own past. I mean, they, they were very diff- difficult years. Um, I went through more than one book of not having an American publisher at all and only publishing over here. And before my big breakout book, We Need, Need to Talk About Kevin, came out in 2003, uh, I was looking at possibly having to quit fiction writing if I was not willing to write for the digital desk drawer. Mm-hmm. And that was very painful. And because uh, that was all I ever wanted to be was a novelist. And I mean, I find I've, in terms of it, of material, uh, it's it's very useful to know what failure feels like. And if you are talking about having sympathy with other people, uh, most other people, then you have to sample disappointment. I think that writers, especially novelists who uh, have a, like a first novel and it takes off, uh, well, they have a different set of problems. But one of those problems is, is having been exiled to an uh a rarefied and unusual condition whereby, you know, at least for the time being, they, they seem, you know, life is set. Uh, everyone loves them. Uh, their future is gleaming. And uh, 
and and it leads you to dangerously uh, assume that the reason that the and the only reason that your first book was such a a big success is that you're exceptional and wonderful and and better than other people and the people whose whose books weren't a, a big success just weren't as good as you are and that is not really the nature of the world um and I I honestly think that while I paid through the nose for the experience of struggling for for a good 12 years uh living on very little money it was good for the work I think I've I think it's meant I have written better books mm -hmm. excellent okay let's move on to your you know social and cultural commentary I wanted to to start by by your ideas about cancel culture you've written a lot about it uh and you've been very courageous uh, so let me quote you here. You wrote that you were raised in a liberal household and you were a lifelong Democrat. And I am dismayed by the ever-growing list of what one can and cannot do or say coming out of left-wing activists by their impulse to control, to instill self-censorship as, as well as to promote real censorship and to deploy sensitivity to, uh, the brut uh, to be brutally insensitive. So what is going on with free speech in the West and why does it trouble you so much? <clears throat> well, I think it should trouble all of us. I mean, even the people who are, are um, trying to control us and censor us are also relying on free speech and that's one of the things that they never seem to get i mean these people think they they are always going to be in control so that nobody will be controlling them and nothing could be further from the truth so i mean i i can say yes my profession is reliant on free speech and in order for me to write readable or entertaining books i need to be able to be daring or even transgressive but it isn't merely a matter for artists or 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 academics uh and the uh, the odd thing is that the the left that i grew up with uh was a big advocate of free speech i mean that's the big flip we've done. Mm -hmm. uh, the America, what's happened to the American Civil Liberties Union is intensely depressing because it's not about defending civil liberties anymore. The a ACLU doesn't believe in free speech anymore, would never defend the right of Nazis to march down Main Street anymore. It's the, the, the organization has been. Uh, utterly undermined in its purpose the trouble is that these discussions of free speech as an abstraction always come across as incredibly flat uh, i catch myself sounding boring <laughs> because <laughs> nobody is out there not very many people are out there claiming we shouldn't have free speech at all uh, and there's something about the subject when it's discussed in the abstract that just doesn't go anywhere. It is in the particular that you realize what's, what's at stake. I mean, to to, to cite a, a laughable and arguably petty example, that business of the, uh, the Stanford uh, list of words that we're not supposed to use anymore, <laughs> which really backfired. Um, that's 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 patently ridiculous but if that were to become real it would stop being funny you know to have these lists of vocabulary that you are no longer allowed to to publish and we're not there yet but uh the authoritarian impulses on the left are so extravagant right now that i don't put it past them to to for publishers, for example, to start issuing lists of words that their authors are not allowed to use. Mm -hmm. 
So I, I, I wanted to go back to this idea. Well, the left has always supported um, you know, free speech, historically at least. So is that necessarily true or maybe put differently, don't you think that is sort of at the root of any collectivism and, and the root the, the and the left ten, tends to be collectivist to uh, to censor, to be authoritarian. Do um, you think there is some merit to that claim? I think there's something about uh, these big collective group causes that is that is authoritarian. After all, I don't think I'd get much flack if I submitted that the that the left has virtual complete control with a few exceptions of mm -hmm. the media and universities and increasingly the upper level of corporations. I mean, it's become a fact. Well, that means that they have an enormous amount of power and, and that's concentrated in within a very narrow political band of, uh, uh, a political band that has been identified as representing about 6% of the American population. When you have that much power, you want to use it. Mm -hmm. That power, power itself uh, encourages people to be authoritarian. It's really fun to push people around. And furthermore, this tiny set of people, they're very competitive with each other. And are always trying to outwoke each other. And therefore that also entices people in positions of authority to, to pass regulations or, or institute policies that, that are ever more extreme. Mm -hmm. I don't see this movement, if we can call it that, I don't see it tempering itself. Uh, it just seems to get worse. Mm -hmm. I, I have people ask me all the time, I think, that because we're all asking our, unless we're involved in it, when, if we're on the outside, we're, we're asking ourselves, well, when is this going to stop? What is going to stop it? Because it just gets worse. Mm -hmm. And that's another question I can't answer. Yeah. You you survived three cancellation attempts, if I'm if I'm correct, if I'm not wrong. Um, can you talk about that's that? That's how you, I count it. That, no, it's three, right, or more mm -hmm. than that, right? Uh, so, can you tell us a bit, a bit about those cancellation attempts? Uh, I think you mentioned a little bit about the cultural appropriation one. Uh, maybe can, can you say something about what is a cultural appropriation and why it's wrong, particularly uh, uh, to to censor? fiction writers and, and then also what happened to you how did you survive that attempt at, at canceling you well i was approached to do the uh, opening address of the brisbane writers festival in 2016 and i wasn't quite sure what to do with it uh i had picked up something about cultural appropriation i actually had to look it up on the internet because i didn't understand what it was it and uh, I mentioned that partly because uh, it's worth remembering that it used to be a, an unknown concept or, or a rather rarefied one. And it applied primarily to the fashion and music industry. Uh, mostly, in, 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 you know, it's about the taboo of stealing cultural property that doesn't belong to you. Um, and, you know, for example, in, this, in, 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 in fashion and music, for white people wearing dreadlocks, that was cultural appropriation and 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 scandalous. But I spotted in this the possibility uh, that the taboo could spread, and there'd been a couple of instances where the same accusation had been leveled at uh, at fiction writers, but it hadn't really happened yet. So I was merely trying to get out in front of a trend that I didn't want to see happen. And in fact, because the the lecture I gave went viral and exploded literally all over the world. My biggest fear was that I I ended up 
promoting the very concept that I wanted to repress. So that's on me. Um, there were there were articles in India and South America <laughs> and South Africa, uh, as well as in the New York Times and you know all over the United States and Europe. I should point out that some of those articles were defending me uh, because I was simply making the point that uh, there is no uh, hard and fast line between cultures that they they naturally in intersect. It is in the nature of cultures to borrow or, if you will, steal from each other, and that that's a productive process, and that in fiction writing, uh, uh, the act of imagining yourself as someone very different than you are is is also a productive process and is one of the things that we go to fiction for is to imagine being other people and to get out of our own heads uh it, and it's one of the purposes that fiction serves mm -hmm. and i made that point that you know if we if we take this too literally then all we're left with is memoir um, but I was quite taken aback by the degree of, of violent opposition to this perspective, because when I first wrote that lecture, my biggest concern was that the point I was making was so self-evident that the lecture would be tedious. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, looking back, uh, not only did I survive that, that uh, onslaught of criticism but i ended up benefiting from it i'm much better known mm -hmm. for having given <laughs> that lecture than uh than i was before so i take a certain mm -hmm. grim nasty satisfaction <laughs> in um in in having triumphed in this case and i by the way i think that if you do survive cancellations that's pretty reliably the case that you get enormous amounts of free publicity and you're stronger and uh, more of a force to re be reckoned with on the other side of it. And the, the sad thing is that everyone doesn't survive it. And there are plenty of people who are ruined and you never hear from them again. But you continue being very outspoken. Are you afraid of not being able to publish your books one day? Do you ever self-censor? I occasionally make a decision that I think is prudent, and you can call that self-censorship. I, I don't make decisions uh, in the interest of prudence that are in any way damaging to my work. If I see a way of not setting a trap for myself then and and yet still accomplishing the same artistic goal, I guess I guess a better way of saying it is I pick my spots, mm -hmm. um, but I don't decline to do a project because I think it's going to get me into trouble. I, you know, I just submitted a new novel and uh, it's a little dangerous. Uh, and I was not 100 percent certain that my editors in uh, London and New York would go for it. Uh, so that's new. You know that that little uncertainty. It's 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 like when I was, you know, younger and 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 struggling. The, the I I was also anxious about whether I would be published. But now I'm anxious about whether I'll be published for completely different reasons. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to identity politics. You you've criticized identity politics very sharply. You, you write about being a tomboy as a teenager and being burdened with stereotypes about men and about women. You even changed your name from Margaret to Lionel, if I understand correctly. You felt that your father underestimated you relative to your brothers because you were a girl, yet you have strongly criticized identity politics um, in the West. What's wrong with the woke concept of identity today? I find it completely reductive. And I also think it's regressive. Mm -hmm. uh, it's true that I pressed against the constraints of being born female from an early age. I grew up between two brothers, and it's true that my parents had higher expectations for them. In some ways, that was an advantage for me, because high expectations can be a burden. 
Um, but I, you know, yes, it did have to do with my sex, and I, I don't want to be naive about these various identities. I don't think there's. I don't think that racism is a fiction. I don't think sexism is a fiction. Certainly in the in the sexism area, I I still sometimes recognize it. I can tell when I'm being treated in a dismissive manner, especially by extremely tall men. Um, I'm only five foot two, and there's something about tall men. They have an attitude problem. <laughs> 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 but um, you know, when I when I was younger, the the whole idea was to get beyond these categories. I mean, they they are restrictive. All black people are not the same. All white people are not the same. All women are not the same. And the uh, the notion was to release us from the prisons of of our these arbitrary classes into which we were born and didn't choose, and to try to become individuals and be able to see each other uh, beyond these. Uh, arbitrary characteristics and now we are enshrining those characteristics in law mm -hmm. uh, and especially over here in the UK uh, they are called protected characteristics under the Equality Act and I mean this is a violation of uh, the whole concept uh, which is fundamental to uh, American legislation and, and the and the constitution and the equality under the law the, the the you know you belong to this special protected category and completely different laws apply to you and that's a corruption of of the democratic process but i'm also i find it the whole way of thinking of people is a corruption of of well, it's a moral corruption, ultimately. It's a refusal to see people as, as individuals, as individual people. It is a flattening. And it's also, um, it's deterministic in the extreme and, in, and in, in a very depressing way. It's like, oh, the only thing that's important about me is that I'm female and straight and maybe American, which is also a prison, which I tried to get out of. Um, and I just, I reject that out of hand, you know? And and I don't want to think about other people that way either. And there's no getting around the fact that this way of thinking ultimately it leads you to sexism and racism and all the other isms that supposedly this movement is bent on opposing. So it it the contradictions... I don't understand how people can live with them. I, it, it's 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 an, it's an outright ugly way of thinking of human beings, and mm -hmm. it's it's going backwards. And in that sense, I really do not understand its appeal. Mm -hmm. Is that also the reason you uh, reject or criticize diversity quotas in publishing or anywhere else? I think um, diversity quotas, affirmative action, as we used to call it, uh, I think affirmative action is uh, counterproductive. Mm -hmm. I think it increases racism. Um, in, for that matter, increases sexism. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, um, in an interesting little moment with myself, uh, I flipped on CNN uh, recently and it was, oh, maybe it was BBC. It was hard talk. And uh, he was interviewing the head of the WHO, who is a Black African woman. And I just immediately assumed, well, uh, she's probably unqualified, probably doesn't know anything about what she's talking about and was hired because she was a black African woman. Mm -hmm. And I just thought that without, you know, listening to what she said, and by the way, what she said was kind of confirmed my expectations, but um, I was, I, I, I did a double take, you know, that was appalling. 
but it was the my expectations were not unreasonable and i shouldn't i shouldn't have had the experience to think that right mm -hmm. to just assume that this person did not deserve to be appointed to her position but that's mm -hmm. what affirmative action does and it, it instills a, a suspicion not just on in in the majority population or however temporarily um but but in in minorities themselves you know i i wouldn't want to get into harvard uh pretty sure that the main reason i got in and and was was my race or my sex or my my sexual orientation uh i would think that would be very discouraging and deeply undermining mm -hmm. and i think you know this is using racism to solve racism and i uh, discrimination to solve discrimination and that's that's just endless and and you know it's been going on for over 50 years in the united states now and I'm afraid that, that the kind of knee-jerk assumption I made when watching Hard Talk is now countrywide in virtually every field. And, mm -hmm. you know, that's evil, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I'm getting complaints that I'm monopolizing the questions here. So I'm going to open it up for people to ask questions. Now, although I have actually a lot of questions myself on woke Puritanism, the lack of sense of humor of the woke, and the microaggression and the language policing. So again, feel free to ask questions. I think Amy wants to ask a question. So Amy, uh, feel free to unmute you. Okay, thank you. And thank you for your very interesting talk. Um, early on in your talk, you said uh, that you think that students are failing to find uh, meaning and uh, a place in life because traditional institutions and concepts uh, and values have failed them. But isn't what's going on now, at least, that traditional institutions and values are being relentlessly attacked and mm -hmm. denigrated and run down uh, to the point where it leaves a void? I mean, it is so common to hear uh, people in universities saying, well, the way things were done in the past, they're sort of presumptively wrong and evil. We need innovation. We need new ways of doing things. The past has to be left behind. So that's my first question. The second, and I realize I'm double dipping here, if we were to go back, get rid of affirmative action, go back to the meritocracy, go back to a single standard, abandon double standards, then people from different groups will not be equally represented uh, in various positions in our society, and especially the most demanding. Let's just be frank. There will be a paucity of black people at the very top. What Do you think that people are ready to accept that? Well, I mean, uh, California passed that referendum uh, making affirmative action in universities against the law and uh and everyone didn't go nuts did they i mean yes uh the number of minority students at state schools uh did drop but you those schools also maintained their standards and that's uh, just the university i mean you know Inc, woke Inc, and right. nonprofits, and every other sector of society is dominated by DIE priorities, even in California. I mean, are are is are the people who are bringing this in and profiting by it, since it, it creates all these sinecures? Uh, willing to let it go of course not they're not going to give it up without a fight uh and our prospects of defeating the dei armies i prefer the die spelling uh look pretty dim right now but the end point 
for this stuff is terrifying because you just don't have standards in anything and all you, and that is happening everywhere and that leads ultimately to complete dysfunction so that you you have incompetence installed at every level just because they tick the racial box or the the sexual orientation box whichever box and this is the road to ruin uh and that's the alternative i mean if you if you want what's 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 increasingly popular right now is not just representation it's over representation um so most of these people are not happy unless basically the all the white people go away and that's definitely happening in publishing with the virtual elimination uh of any but a handful of white males especially new writers they're just not taking on white male writers so the 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 this is rotting uh western civilization i i just it is rotting it uh and if and you look at at field after field i mean heather mcdonald's has a very well documented what's happening in classical music uh that that all that all that the powers that be seem to care about is is diversity and at the same time they're just not that many diverse musicians so what you do is you have to take the tiny number of diverse musicians and they all get to first chair i mean it, this has to be challenged on a practical level as well as on a on a philosophical level what we all want is a functional country and a fair country and this dei fanaticism is neither functional nor fair mm -hmm. well, what was your what was the first question amy oh isn't it the the constant unrelenting denigration of anything traditional uh anything that you know comes out of the past um that is disorienting our young people well i don't think they're being educated i don't think they're getting seriously educated i mean it, education is a humbling experience it's also incredibly exciting so uh you you start taking on how much has come before you how much has already been achieved it's awesome and that's what makes it exciting but it it's a little intimidating and there's a, a natural callowness to to being young because you don't know anything and therefore why should you have any appreciation for what's come before you you don't know what it is and because you are young and you know that you are the future and you think you are uh immortal and 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 you're about to take over there's a natural arrogance to that to a, a feeling that that you know we're better than you we're younger than you we're stronger than you we're going to be around by the time and uh, when you're dead and 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 this is all new to us and 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 we we understand it and you don't there's something about the state of being young that's how everybody is i was too and education is valuable partly for hammering that out of you and getting you to shut up and appreciate your forebearers and also to head you off and say you know what i'm sorry you think these are new ideas but they're not new ideas they're old ideas and in fact socialism for example has been tried any number of times and every single time it has ended in catastrophe and so you know you keep your mouth shut and 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 read about stalin and mao etc but the this there seems to be a complete abandonment on the part of of education both 
both in university and and in in uh, earlier uh, levels of education, but especially in university, that that it's all you know client led and uh, students should only should have to be able to recognize themselves. You know, they're only going to study someone who looks like them. I hate that expression. Um, <laughs> It's a, it's an abandonment of the entire purpose of university, and that has implications not just in terms of what people, what graduates know, but who they are and how they regard themselves. And that humbling is crucial to developing into a mature adult. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth has a question. I'm glad you recognize me. As Elizabeth, even though it probably says John Cocker, and I'm a stowaway on this call. Uh, I have another point, but I just want to say the interesting thing about young people um, all being opinionated and thinking they know everything has always been true. But the change now is that we're actually giving them power. We're raising up the Greta Thunbergs and the and telling, you know, making them out to be the um, you know knowledgeable sage innocents who have uh, understand where the future should go. But my real comment is I may be the only other fiction writer on this call, but, and I do think it, it's, it's informing this historical uh, piece that I'm doing as well, but not in a way, you know, people need to be hit over the head. And if you don't say it out loud, they don't. Most of my friends, when I guide them toward a libertarian um, issue, agree with it. I have yeah. very, a very progressive friends where I've gotten them to sort of agree with school choice ideas without realizing it. It's, it's kind of a natural human, um, human belief system, I think. I do too. I think it's naturally American. I think it's the basis of the constitution is fundamentally libertarian. We just don't call it that all the time. But as for your work and your opinions, uh, I can understand the socially awkward nature of your life considering where you live. But as for the work itself, I guess the one thing I could say that's encouraging is that there is so little competition for a, a non-progressive outlook that it's to your huge commercial advantage and the the ironic thing is that the non-progressive outlook is the outlook of most of the country and that includes any number of book buyers so i mean i think despite the fact that i'm rather isolated uh and probably get a lot less a lot fewer uh invitations to literary festivals as a consequence, I think that my profile has been raised because I don't fit the political mold as all of my other fiction writing competitors. And, and that means there is a market out there. There is a but market you have to, you have to for non-progressive literary work. You have to get through the gate, gatekeepers, though, and you have to win your first prize. And yep. Don't and count you on, don't, you you're not going to win another prize. Oh, you're not going to win a prize. No, I, I, I imagine I have, I have also, I've won my last literary prize. It, I, I will never get another one because uh, I wouldn't even be considered. The prizes especially have become incredibly political and obsessed with diversity. And I, I, I I don't know why they think book buyers are so stupid, but, you know, when you put out a, a short list after short list and, you know, there's one white person on it and it's, and, and the country's over 80% white, I'm talking about the UK, uh, people notice and therefore they don't, they, they, they realize that your standards are not which of the books of the year are especially good. So they don't take the prize seriously anymore. So the, the, the happy thing about you're not probably going to be a candidate for these prizes is they, they, they are destroying themselves and they don't mean anything anymore. So you don't have to feel bad about it. 
but uh thank you lionel and um i like your trajectory pardon me it sounded a bit like mine as well and in particular i grew up neither being indian nor american so i don't want to be part of anything so i'm an independent contractor both as an individual and as a scientist i do everything and i don't want to be part of groups so where do I see this coming in? I would give a proposition and suggest maybe what do you think about this? I think the issue, and I tend to agree with Amy, is that there's too much empathy. There's a cult of empathy in the Anglophone culture now. And I say this as an Asian, and we don't have that. So our parents don't tell us they love us because they say, if you ask us that, you're an idiot. You know, so, you know, tiger mother, tiger father, we don't have that. And there's this cult of empathy and self-esteem that we've created in children. And now they're young adults and millennials. And they're the ones we see writing for the Guardian or the New York Times. So with this cult of empathy, where it becomes dangerous, a selective empathy, then we apply selective empathy to some people, women, not men, gays, not straights, blacks, not whites. And so all of a sudden, it's especially important to say black women in hijabs are especially traumatized and stressed when in fact most people getting killed are straight white men. So you find ways to get selective empathy to certain people. It makes you feel good about yourself. And, and it's worst, I think, having left religion as you did it as well, it, it, I think it actually is a religious like quality to it. And as John McWhorter says, woke is like a cult. It's worse than religion because it's religion without any of the values built in. So there's a religious like quality to these people where they are using selective empathy to lift up some people at the expense of others. Uh, anyway, that's my thought. Curious what your thoughts yeah, are. I, I wonder, I wonder whether it's real empathy, uh, as you said, to make them feel better about themselves. In and some I just, cases, yes and no. Academia is filled with old liberal white men who want to piss away everything, give free things to everyone else because mm -hmm. they think we're a bunch of they're they're a bunch of old leftist white men. But there's others who just want to look good, and they want to look good, and they want to look better than the Fox News crowd. That's what I think. So it's virtual. Well, it's, it's yeah. Like, I mean, like, I, I just, I just think that that this whole movement is is emotionally insincere. So it's driven by negative energy. Uh, I'm a very negative person myself, so I should be sympathetic, but I'm not. <laughs> um, it doesn't have. I mean, it it, do, it lacks. Although it has many of the uh qualities of religion and, and that's become positively trite to to observe it lacks the positive part i mean most religions have something higher that that they worship that and some kind of goal that adherents are supposed to be trying to achieve and aside from some kind of amorphous you know, a more just world thing, which is too vague to mean anything. This is, there is no positive vision. It is all dark and it's all about vengeance. It's all about the assertion of power. It is not, there's nothing nice about it. There's no, there are no sunny uplands. There is no heaven. It is all hell. It is all punishment. I agree. It's very Marxist in origin, and I actually reject the idea that they have good intentions because I would propose the Nazis had good intentions too. I don't buy that. It depends on what your intentions are. So I, I, I'm not interested in someone's good intentions. And what I am interested in is 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 the, is the freedoms and liberties, and that's what's being eroded now by these people. Yeah. Well, I mean, I I I can I can understand the the desire to have purpose. Okay, and and we don't have religion anymore. And uh, these people are also all being told that the democracy has failed. Democracy has been hollowed out. Um, they've lost purpose and they've become activists like Greta Thunberg. And mm -hmm. as Jordan Peterson, the rise of Jordan Peterson, I love because he's giving young people uh, meaning. My, I have teenage yeah. kids and their friends read Jordan Peterson. It's fantastic. They need to have meaning. So I'll leave it with that. Yes. Okay. 
And and jo Jordan Peterson has had success partly because he has some positive mes message. He spends a lot of time, of course, talking about what's wrong with the world. But he does try to offer men, young men in particular a positive vision of their future and a positive vision of masculinity. And mm -hmm. that there is no positive corollary in the current far left progressive message. Thank you. Farida. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, I'm hailing from University of Virginia. Thank you so much for your interview, for your words. Um, when you were having the conversation back and forth with Amy, you, not with Amy, um, with um, the uh, fellow author, the fellow fictionist, you Lisa. said that there's an unexploited um, audience of of a gross majority, probably in the United States and the UK, various other places in the world, um, that are not so hard left, that may be moderate, et cetera, et cetera, and that are hungry for content. And that gives you an audience. And I, I immediately thought of Yellowstone, actually, which is this show that mm -hmm. has taken off in the United States. I was telling my friend the other day, wait for the Yellowstone effect in Hollywood, because now these huge, you know, um, actors are signing on to do these spinoffs. And there's obviously a really untapped um, demographic here. And I, I think that what Hollywood loves even more than hard left ideology is making money at the box mm -hmm. office. So stay tuned for that. The one question that I had about it, though, is that for those of us who are in academia, it sometimes feels as though the market here is small in such a way that it's much harder to find an audience in academia for various different papers or ideas, et cetera. It's a much more controllable, I think, demographic. And I, I think I would feel as if I had more freedom if I was like a creative writer or something like that. Um, just taking my content to you know, all the folks in general, but when you have an academic audience, it's a lot harder. And I was just wondering, do you think that there is that parallel audience, like closet moderates in academia, um, that we should be as fearless with our content, even if it is moderate or heaven help you right wing? Um, how do you feel about that? Well, I mean, I guess, Forums like the one we're using now are an example of, of like-minded people recognizing each other uh, within academia and bonding together and trying trying to be forthright and and share each other's problems. I mean, this is this is a huge problem everywhere. Uh, I imagine that there is a proportion of uh, academic communities that uh, are just keeping their mouths shut, and I don't know what I don't know what the, those proportions are, because there, there's certainly plenty of people who are in lockstep with the new ideology, and and so you don't hear from more moderate voices. I feel sorry for anyone in academia right now. I, I think it just it must be hideous. And I thank God I'm not a part of university. I I wouldn't be able to bear it. Um, I would have long before been canceled if I were in a university setting. So you 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 really have my sympathy. Uh, and and I I understand people who have jobs who correctly analyze the culture they're working in. And make all kinds of compromises in order to remain employed because they have their, you know, they, they have a sense of calling about their field and as well as mortgages and families. And there's only so outspoken you can afford to be. Uh, the trouble is that those forces mean that this ideology just gallops apace. 
And, uh, you know, and then there's the self-selection problem of who in their right mind with a conservative perspective would go into academia right now. It, it would just be nuts. So they don't. So it's all the far left loons who end up going into the faculty. It's it's this constant self feeding loop, mm-hmm. and I I I don't I don't know how if I were in that circumstance with a family and a mortgage and I needed to keep my job I'm not quite sure how I'd handle it either. You know I uh, I I think it it would be vain of me to assume that, oh, I'd still be out there crusading. Maybe not. Mm-hmm. So let me ask you a question, uh, Lionel, maybe a personal one. So I apologize for asking a bit of a personal question. So I, I've seen many very illiberal initiatives um, so popping up in, in academia recently, including Stanford. But there is, there is a particular one that worries me very much, and I wanted to ask your opinion about it and also perhaps to raise awareness. So um, many American universities uh, are implementing uh, online systems where students can sort of um, denounce each other uh, because of uh, identity aggressions or microaggressions. So, so this is a system that uh, essentially encourages anonymous reporting on each other um, that is also administered apparently by a third party, uh, which is sort of collecting this information, could could be hacked, you know, eventually it could leak. And I see this as a completely unacceptable totalitarian practice that mm-hmm. will encourage probably the worst tendencies of human beings. But I wanted to I wanted to hear your views of it. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Do you think I am I, I am maybe a bit too paranoid about about this uh, you know recent initiative being no I don't think you're paranoid. Mm-hmm. It's it's intrinsically Maoist. Uh, and by the way that's one of those accusations that too many students don't get they don't take it seriously because they don't know anything about maoism um i'm afraid that 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 the kind of atmosphere that these sorts of initiatives create it's it's turn it's it's starting to be everywhere that you know we're all living in fear we're all watching our step watching what we say worried that someone's going to tell on us you know from my own perspective even i have to think you know is this going on youtube am i going to finally say what the one thing out of my mouth that ends my career and i live in that world too it's foul you know i some i have to say i sometimes worry because i do a lot of journalism i've got a column in the spectator so i write about the whole you know, woke thing. I'm sick of that word. We just, we don't know how to get away from it. Um, and I sometimes worry that I'm, I'm wasting my life, that this is a, a, a passing, uh, a passing infatuation. Uh, this is the only time I'm going to be alive as far as I know. And I should be concerning myself with something more enduring, more, you know, with a broader perspective, step back. Maybe I'm getting caught up in something petty. But honestly, I don't think it is petty. I think I think it's huge. I think it's extremely dangerous. And I think it is destroying the basis of Western civilization and that the, the rejection of meritocracy, the, the rejection of free speech, the embrace of authoritarianism, and they do embrace authoritarianism, even if they don't call it that. And they want to control everything. I, I find it very frightening. And, and I, and that's why I haven't disengaged because I, th- I, I think it's, it is important. 
Thank you, Leonel. Uh, so we have time for one more question, John. <laughs> feel free to ask your question. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ivan. Thank you, Lionel, for this saying things which should be obvious <laughs> and 30 years ago were obvious and that's the incredible thing i'm a brit i'm a transported person like you and in the opposite direction at duke university um and i i was absolutely unbelievably shocked in 2020 when the ho whole of my department seemed to be hysterical about george floyd george floyd that was quite extraordinary to me and were utterly shocked when I suggested this really didn't have anything to do with psychology or neuroscience or a department or academics in general as a collective. Anyway, that is by, by the way comment. But I want to ask about another thing. I th think you're right that this, this movement is hostile to Western civilization, sometimes quite explicitly so. I mean, there's no argument about it. They're, they're again it. And so they go around tossing. Uh, pulling down statues, Theodore Roosevelt, you know, even uh, uh, Lincoln's statues pulled down. I think uh, what shocked and depressed me is that nobody fought back. Mm. We didn't have a mob of, uh, of uh, lib <laughs> libertarians fighting these idiots who were pulling down these representatives of our civilization. Do you have any thought about that? Well, why is that? What's the problem? I mean, if these people can achieve their aim, as they often do, by a violence or close to violence, it seems as if the only reasonable, successful opposition will be of the same sort. Somebody's got to oppose them. You know, it's just a thought. Thanks again. Well, you're you're right. Somebody's got to oppose them. But the trouble is that post George Floyd, if you pushed back against the Black Lives Matter movement. And all the DEI insanity. I mean, we went insane. There was an international insanity at that point. And I think it was fed by the COVID hysteria and the COVID lockdowns. And there was a lot of pent up energy, but everyone went nuts. And that has not stopped. That lunacy is still going on. Um, and the trouble was that if you push back against it, you were defending the murder of unarmed black men by the police. You know, the, the trouble was that the 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 incident that set this whole thing off did have a a certain or, or at least to all appearances moral simplicity to it. Yes it did. <laughs> and and therefore there was no other side, right? So that's why there was no opposition. If you accept, I mean, and you know, we can get into the particulars and we won't. But if you accept the paradigm of what happened, then it was completely unjustifiable and it was murder and you had to be against it. Well, of course, but the trouble is that the, there was a linkage there, that it was hard that because we all started basically on the same side, that this, this, therefore we have to do all these crazy so-called anti-racist things. And, 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 you know, the, the speaker of the house has to get down on her knee in candy cloth. And I, the trouble is that because we didn't, because the opposition to all this lunacy still started from a, 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 a point of ultimate moral unity. Nobody was sticking up for Derek Chauvin, you know, nobody. But that that meant that somehow structurally it was hard to stop it. And uh, I, mean, I, I just think that on a narrative political level, that's that's the simplest explanation for it. Of course, explaining things, <laughs> It, it, it is basically a passive affair and doesn't help anything. Yeah, I guess my my feeling was not uh, a lack of sympathy for Mr. Floyd, but the question of what on earth has this got to do with an academic department as a collective? Why absolutely should we... nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. Right. And that's... that's why I say it was it was it was a it was collective insanity. I mean, yeah. you had you had uh, young people trooping through the streets in South Korea for Black Lives Matter, that country 
doesn't have any black people. What are they talking about? Indeed. Right? I mean, that, 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 that tips you off. These people have gone nuts. It was, and, and actually this is the inspiration for my most recent novel, which is not published yet, is that I am deeply disturbed by what I see as a sequence of what international manias uh, very close on their heels. And they're not just the United States. They often start in the United States, but they spread everywhere in no time. And, and you, can, you can blame it on social media, but again, the big deal, have an explanation. It doesn't matter. What matters is that they're happening. So like in 2012, suddenly everyone is obsessed with transgenderism. And, 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 and then there was the Me Too movement that went all over the world. Uh, there was the Black Lives Matter movement that went all over the world. And this was in within days. Um, the COVID lockdowns went all over the world. And for that matter, this obsession with uh, climate change has all the markings of another international mania. And, you know, we this technological connectedness apparently leads to the capacity to go nuts on a grand scale. You mean that you're opposed to Greta? I'm, I'm shocked, shocked <laughs> to hear it. I bet you're shocked. <laughs> yeah, but seriously, I mean, what, we, what you're pointing to in a way is an argument for religion because it gives people a kind of stability that they don't have now. I mean, I'm not arguing for religion, but something like that would give, the, give people a way, a perspective, some kind of perspective that goes beyond the little dramatic incident. Don, it's homo religiosus. Homo religiosus. That's who we are. Okay. Yeah, maybe so. Okay. Thank On that you, note, so thank you very much, Lionel, for a fascinating conversation. We we could stick for one more hour talking about oh, yeah. these topics. I, I really <laughs> enjoy talking to you all. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. It was great. <clears throat> We'll all read your next novel. <laughs> okay. I made I sold a few copies today then. <laughs> exactly.